Well, hey there again, it's Christy, and it's time for another episode of This Week in Stupid Misogynists. In this episode, I'm focusing on UK politics. But before we start that, I have two comments from the last video that I want to read. From Jeremiah's. Hi, Christy. Could you recommend me any literature to learn about feminism as someone who doesn't know much about it? Great video as always. Well, thanks, Jeremiah. I appreciate that. And I do have a book recommendation for you, Reclaiming the F Word. In fact, I did a video about this book and the introduction to it, and I'll link that for you in the description box below. It's more UK based since the authors are writing it in the UK, but it does touch on international issues as well. Let me know if you're able to get a copy and what you thought of the book. From Lee Keys. Thank you, love the comment update at the beginning of the video. I really had no idea women faced such issues. I assume that they did, but it helps pointing out the examples. Do you think male victims of sexual harassment are treated the same or better than women? In my personal experience, when I, a male, reported sexual harassment in high school by fellow female students, it was met with laughter. Hey Leakies, thank you so much for replying to the video about sexism at work, which was the last episode of This Week in Stupid Misogynist. First, let me say how sorry I am to hear that you experienced sexual harassment at school. I do think that men face different kinds of barriers to be taken seriously when it comes to sexual harassment. I think sexual harassment is generally dismissed too lightly, whoever the victims are. The reasons given for dismissing sexual harassment really depend on the sex of the person who's the victim, doesn't it? Men are thought to not be able to be harassed by women because men always want to have sex. And women get dismissed when they complain about sexual harassment because people will say, oh, she was just taking a compliment out of context and she's just being too sensitive. You know, questioning those stereotypes and those myths understanding how harmful they are to victims and how they silence people and force them to endure more sexual harassment or allow harassers to continue to harass them or other people, that's where we really have to do the work in our society and that's what I think the work of feminism is doing. You know, everyone should be able to go to work without having to fear being degraded or demeaned sexually by a colleague or a boss. And those solutions in terms of the myths and stereotypes are going to be gendered. But I don't think men have it, say, better um, in terms of their victimization in the workplace than women. I think it's a different kind of sexism that's directed at male victims. In this episode, I focus on stories from the United Kingdom. That's because, again, I want to move away from my Americentric view of the world, but also because the issues that are faced by people are different depending on the country and the laws that they live under. This first story is another example of how women's access to healthcare depends a lot upon what men in positions of power have decided they can have in terms of that access. This actually comes from humanism.org.uk, and it's a petition to help Northern Ireland women access free abortion in Great Britain. It reads, A Supreme Court judgment handed down on the 14th of June has said that Northern Ireland women have to pay as much as £2,000 to have an abortion on the NHS in England. In Northern Ireland, women cannot have an abortion except in the most extreme circumstances, meaning only the wealthiest women in Northern Ireland can access legal, safe abortions in the same way as they do in Britain. The court has found that making Northern Ireland women pay for abortions is a political decision and that the relevant health secretary, Jeremy Hunt, can allow free access to Northern Ireland women if he chooses. The same logically applies to the health secretaries who look after NHS Wales and NHS Scotland, and Nicola Sturgeon already promised last year to investigate the possibility of allowing free abortions for Northern Ireland women throughout NHS Scotland. Plaid Cymru leader Leanne Wood told Humanists UK she supports the same in Wales. They go on to write, We cannot allow our fellow citizens in Northern Ireland to continue to have their human rights breached in this way. We are asking you to petition the Prime Minister and the First Minister of Scotland and Wales to urge that NHS abortion services are made available, free of charge, to women who travel from Northern Ireland. Generally, I'm not happy with politicians being in charge of women's health care, and so I'm not going to take a lot of comfort in the idea that Nicola Sturgeon and Leanne Wood are women for the sake of women. I am heartened by the reporting in this 
petition that they are both supportive of the idea of allowing women to come over who need to access the medical services. I would very much hope that Jeremy Hunt would also provide the same kind of access to women going over to seek abortion services in England, because as the article points out, this isn't a matter of allowing abortion or not rich women can access these abortion services. So the question is, for the health ministers, do they want to deny poor women access to medical care? I've heard popular YouTubers say that feminism isn't needed in the West because women in the West have achieved equality already. But what evidence, other than just their opinion, do they produce to back that statement up? Last week, I focused on inequality that American women experience in the workplace when it comes to sexual discrimination and harassment in the Department of Justice and at Uber. Here's another example of an industry that has a sexism problem, this time from the UK. From the article, why'd he get promoted? Because he has a dick. Sexism in publishing survey reveals widespread frustration. The author writes, if you want to know whether there is a gender gap in the books world, all you have to do is walk the floor of any major publisher. Women dominate the open plan spaces where assistants and lower level managers sit. The offices allocated to senior management, those with decision making power, are predominantly taken by men. This unequal, if unsurprising, reality has come into focus in a survey of the industry undertaken by The Guardian following up anecdotal reports that women were being kept out of the top tiers despite making up the bulk, an estimated 60 to 80 percent of the industry's workforce. The survey of 80 women and 12 men, the overwhelming majority of whom spoke only on the condition of anonymity, showed that the majority felt women had been increasingly excluded from the top tier due to a variety of factors, institutional sexism, inflexible working practices, and opaque promotional and pay structures that result in men consistently being paid more than female colleagues in the same role. The belief that pregnancy was a career killer was widely held. Naomi, who holds a managerial role in the editorial department of one of the big five corporate publishers, said the discrimination was often subtle. Others report seeing colleagues being demoted while on maternity leave. Male and female respondents blamed sexist attitudes for the ability of men to fast-track their careers, despite the overwhelming numbers of women at entry and junior level. There was a strong perception among respondents that, in the words of one respondent, quote, men are seen as special assets to be retained or promoted, while the women expected to fall by the wayside on the path to the top, unquote. Another reported that her senior male colleagues feel, quote, that the younger female employees make good assistants and secretaries, but aren't considered seriously for more creative or senior roles." Unquote. Emily said, quote, It became a joke in the office with a very senior, sympathetic male boss. When an editorial assistant was promoted after six months in a job to a position that could have been filled by a woman with more experience and equal talent, I'd ask why, genuinely wanting to know if he was super talented. He'd reply, because he has a dick. One of the things that was mentioned in the story is the idea that women are penalized for becoming pregnant and taking maternity leave. And this idea of women being connected with incompetence because they give birth to a child is not at all rare. On the one hand, society tells women that being a mom is the most important job a woman can have. Whereas the job of being a dad is also important, men aren't considered incapable of doing a job because they've become a father yet women are. For an example, check out this guy. She'll be too busy changing nappies, Tory says Labour candidate shouldn't be an MP because she's pregnant. A Tory councillor has sparked a sexism row by saying a pregnant Labour candidate will be too busy changing nappies to work as an MP. John Wright made his comments on the Facebook profile of Catherine Atkinson, who is standing for a seat in Derbyshire. He suggested she would be unable to do her job whilst on maternity leave, and would be too busy changing nappies to be a voice for the people. Councillor Wright wrote, quote, Funny, she, Catherine, never mentioned she was heavily pregnant. I wonder how she could represent the people of Arawash whilst on maternity leave. How can a woman who is just about to give birth take on a role as MP? Unquote. In a later post, he added, Brexit on the horizon, and she might be too busy changing nappies to be a voice for the people of Arawash. Councillor Wright has since defended his comments and claimed he is not sexist. But Catherine, whose daughter is due to be born in July, has demanded an apology. Catherine said, 
I require an apology not for me, I'm used to standing up to bullies, but on behalf of all the young mothers out there, they shouldn't be put off running for parliament. We need their voices. They are as much members of the community as anyone else. A spokesman for the Conservative Party in Arawash said, quote, The recent comments made by Councillor Wright on social media are neither the views of the Conservative Party or the Conservative Party candidate for Arawash. The fact is that using motherhood against women is no new thing. One thing that fascinates me is how little anti-feminist arguments have changed since the beginning. On the screen, I'm going to flash up a series of pictures that were produced during the fight for women to have the vote. Today, many anti-feminist YouTubers hold up first-wave feminism as the good kind of feminism that they agree with, but they're still drawing on the sexism and patriarchal values that opposed allowing women to vote or to be equal citizens. These images say, Hey, don't let women vote and become part of public life because if you do, then you'll have to be a parent to your own children and do some housework. Oh, <laughs> the horror. The solution here in my view is to change the way we think about parenting and change the expectations we put on people in society. We need policies that promote a work-life balance for men and women. And the government honestly needs to do more to find and punish companies that discriminate against their female employees who've given birth. And speaking of challenging gender roles in our society, let's move on to our next story. Boys at Exeter Academy wear skirts in uniform protest. The pupils from the ISCA Academy in Exeter asked permission to modify their uniforms because of the hot weather. One of the boys who took part in the protest said, we're not allowed to wear shorts and I'm not sitting in trousers all day. It's a bit hot. Head teacher Amy Mitchell said shorts were not part of the school uniform as first reported by Devon Live. People said that the idea for the protest came from the head teacher who originally made the suggestion, although one student said he did not think she was being serious. They said they hoped the school would reconsider its shorts policy as a result of the protest and the head has indicated it might be considered. As a follow-up to the story, the policy was changed and boys are now allowed to wear shorts. And my congratulations to these lads on what is probably their first ever political campaign. I suspect part of the reason this got so much press was because of the image of the boys wearing skirts. Of course, the Scots have been wearing kilts for centuries, so in all honesty, I think this caused less of a pushback in the UK than it would have in other countries. It's not as if the idea of a Scots warrior charging at you in his kilt is somehow lacking in intimidation. You know, In comparison, I don't think boys in the Deep South would have felt as comfortable using the same tactic. An interesting thing I saw on social media were people who were happy for the boys getting the right to wear shorts, but a few of them raised the question of gendered clothing altogether. Why not just allow the boys and the girls to wear skirts or shorts as they like? There's an interesting discussion to be had on how our clothes are used to signal our status and our social position. We don't really have time for that in this episode, but I at least wanted to raise it. But what are your thoughts on boys wearing skirts? Let me know in the comments section below and I may read out your comment in the next video. We've covered a lot of pretty intense topics and I wanna leave you on something to think about, not necessarily positive or negative, just something for you to consider. I wanted to highlight this blog post from the LSE. Two researchers discuss the relationship between gender equality and peace and argue that realizing a feminist foreign policy requires more than securing women's rights to equal participation. From the blog, feminist research, for instance, presented in the book Sex and World Peace, has linked microaggressions in the private to macroaggression at the national level. The attitudes we have concerning appropriate gender roles and the value we attach to that, which is considered male and female, are likely to translate to similar judgments regarding other social categorizations, such as other countries or other religious groups. In a series of analyses presented in our recently published article, Pacific Men, How the Feminist Gap Explains Hostility, we demonstrate that individuals who are more positive toward gender equality are also less likely to view other countries as enemies or to express intolerant views toward religious groups. More specifically, individuals who agree that women and men should have equal rights, as well as individuals who prefer equal marriages where husband and wife both provide for and take care of the family, to marriages with a more traditional division of labor, are statistically less likely to describe other countries as enemies or to demonstrate intolerant views towards Jews, Christians, or Muslims. 
Importantly, these relationships hold among men and women also when analyzed separately. Indeed, the sex of the respondent is much less important than his or her attitudes to gender equality when the objective is to predict hostile and intolerant attitudes. These findings validate earlier research findings and from other regions, but serve as a much needed reminder about how and why gender equality and peace are related, and why feminist and egalitarian men also have a role to play in realizing a feminist foreign policy. We would therefore argue that the real value of feminist foreign policy is forwarding gender equal values. We agree that we need to ensure a peace process is inclusive and gender sensitive, but we claim this does not imply an exclusive focus on women per se. Rather, to ensure peace, we need to focus on the inclusion of people, men or women, with feminist egalitarian attitudes. When these attitudes are found among the men and women who are promoted to powerful positions, they stand a greater chance of being translated into policy, and this is when we are likely to see a more sustainable peace. As someone who studies political behavior, those patterns that they found don't surprise me at all. In fact, they map onto other studies that link attitudes on gender roles to other social issues. Of particular importance is their observation that biological sex is far less important than people's attitudes. This is the same finding from my own research, which mapped measures of masculine and feminine onto political views. It's because of this evidence that the idea that there are only two genders makes no sense to me, since individual men and women can vary on a range of metrics that are deemed either masculine or feminine by social norms. But I'm getting into a technical talk that I don't have too much time for. If you found this little clip interesting, then I suggest you read the whole blog and take a deeper look into the study that they cited. Okay guys, I hope you feel like you've learned something by the end of this video, that you're a bit more familiar with some of the challenges facing women in the United Kingdom, and also some of the ideas that are out there in terms of gender roles and, and how they influence uh, other things in our society. All that's left to be said at this point is the usual. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. I do appreciate your time and attention, and you and I will be seeing each other again very soon. Bye-bye. A special thank you to my patrons. These are the people who make the Resistance Fund possible, and also who are responsible for the increased production value and microphone quality that you're enjoying now. To protect their identities, I give my patrons a secret agent name. So to all of my secret agents, thank you so much for your support. Thank you.